Excellencies, dear colleagues, friends, good afternoon and a happy International Women's Day. Let me start by thanking Cameroon's Minister of Post and Telecommunications, Minete Libon Lilikan, and Australia's Ambassador to the United Nations in Geneva, Amada Gori, for being here with us today. I'm very pleased to open this second Women in Sanitation Expert Group WISE event. It gives us the chance to recognize those individuals, organizations, and administrations that have spread no effort in ensuring gender equality in ITU's standardization work. I want to congratulate the chair and the vice chair of WISE, Dr. Rim. Pedro Hassin Sharif of Tunisia Telecom and uh, Dr. Young Jun King, President of uh, Korea's uh, ETRI, Elect Electronics and Telecommunications Research Institute. I was told that the women's participation at the WTSA this time was just about 30% this year. It is an improvement on the previous WTSA but uh, we need uh, to do better, a lot better. I count on WISE to continue to play an important role in encouraging the active participation of women in the activities and the leadership rules of ITU's telecommunication standardization sector. Our development and the radio communication sectors are engaged in the same effort through the launch of a network of women for this year's WTDC and next year WRC 2023. I'm grateful for these efforts and I call on everyone to make women's active participation in ITU activities and conferences an organization wide effort at PP 2022. I, I have the uh, honor to see our chairman of PP22 here with us. I think that we should keep this uh, promise. This will be the first time that we try to mainstream a gender perspective in the rule out of this conference. And this is a priority for ITU. Our goal for PP22 is to have at least 35% of women among delegates, improving on what was achieved four years ago at the PP18. Unfortunately, this is not depending on the chairman himself, not depending on Secretary General of ITU neither. It will be a collective effort from everybody of us. If I may, I still want to remember one issue that at the previous WRC, we had our radio assembly. And that radio assembly had received proposals from different regions for the vice chairman of radio assembly. But unfortunately, at that moment, we did not have any lady vice chairman, if my memory is correct. Then we try to encourage our regional coordinator to help us if we can have uh, some lady candidate be nominated as a representative of the regions. Unfortunately, finally, we did not. So that is uh, something I found is, uh, is pity. So what I, I'm saying that we really count on our members, count on our regional coordinators, try to encourage the presentation of a candidate from ladies experts to join us for the leadership. And of course, last WRC, we did have a very good improvement of women participation. If my memory is correct, that in 2012 WRC, we had around 12% of women participants, while in 2019, we had about 18%. So that is 50% more. But compared with this time, WTSA, 18% compared with 
You don't need me to tell, to tell you the difference. Why are from 30% to 35% in a couple of months? That uh, will be also something we need to work hard. So I encourage all of you to help us to bring more women experts to our conferences, to present more women candidates for leadership positions. This brings me to the grant agreement that I'm about to sign with the government of Australia. Thanks to Australia's generous support, today's agreement will help set new benchmarks for women's representation at PP 2022. It will help raise women's voice in our decision-making process and advocate, advocate for women in leadership roles at PP 2022 and beyond. I heard someone's uh, uh, inquiries so why I, gave, I had this uh, clear uh, percentage of information in my mind. That's because I'm an international gender champion and I always keep these things in my mind. And last night I joined uh, Geneva-based uh, international gender champagne reception hosted by our American ambassador so that we renewed this kind of information. And at that meeting, we heard also that the uh, situation in Geneva-based uh, UN agencies is not that kind of uh, satisfactory to us, so that we need really to work hard. So as the UN Secretary General said, UN Secretary General, it's not the ITU Secretary General. The UN Secretary General said, when women are missing from decision making, we see the world through only one perspective. On this day, let's encourage the active and meaningful participation of women in all our activities and conferences so that we can see the world through all perspectives. Let's recognize women's achievements, the challenges they face, and the actions we can take, all of us, together to advance gender equality globally. Thank you again to Australia for this support. I hope others will follow this example and join us in breaking down gender barrier within and outside ITU. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Zhao, for those uh, insightful remarks. Uh, I would now like to invite uh, Ambassador uh, Mrs. Amanda Gurley, permanent representative of uh, Australia, to deliver her keynote address. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Secretary General. Uh, Honourable Minister from Cameroon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here on International Women's Day to launch with the ITU this training program to bolster the participation of women delegates in, in the ITU plenipotentiary. We're doing this because boosting the role of women in ITU deliberations is the right thing to do. But it's also the sensible thing to do to improve policy outcomes. At the 2018 plenipotentiary, I hear only 28% of delegates were women. And we are determined to improve this. Clearly, if women aren't present from the outset, then their perspectives and needs are unlikely to be represented properly in the outcomes. If women are not equal participants in the conversation, how can we deliver on the sustainable development goals and fully and equally realise the opportunities afforded by technology? How can we influence ICT policy and standards development to deliver increased accessibility and meaningful connectivity? How can we ensure safe access to technology which reflects the particular vulnerability of women and girls? And how can we ensure that AI systems don't magnify gender and racial biases and um, that technology is designed for female physiques and voices? 
We are all familiar with the refrain, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And this is evident in all walks of life. But I think in STEM, it stands out for special mention. In Australia, our situation is not dissimilar to many other countries, with the number of women in STEM qualified occupations at just 13%. Australia is determined to change this and to break down existing barriers and address structural and cultural biases that stand in the way of girls and women studying STEM subjects and excelling in the careers that follow. In 2018, we appointed the first Women in STEM Ambassador, Professor Lisa Harvey-Smith, who's mobilising Australia's business leaders, educators and policy makers to increase the participation of women and girls in STEM um, studies and careers. And while it's a long road ahead, the proportion of women studying STEM um, at universities is on the increase, making up to 36% um, of enrolments at universities in 2021. And I'm pleased to say my daughter is one of them. Um, we are also supporting women in STEM through our development program. For example, in our region, we are assisting mid-career women in the internet industry to build their network engineering and management skills. I welcome the ITU's adoption of gender equality and mainstreaming um, policies, which promote gender equality initiatives through its sectors. This is a valuable step, but important work remains for all of us. When considering the composition of our ITU delegations and roles of individuals, we must ensure that the valuable and essential contribution of women is front of mind. I'm pleased to say that more than half of Australia's delegation to the current WTSA um, are women, but I know this doesn't tell the whole story and participation goes beyond just numerical representation. It is about the extent to which women have the skills, confidence and empowerment to actively engage and influence outcomes and to take on roles like vice chairs um, in the future. This training initiative is designed to achieve this, to improve the capacity of women delegates to participate in negotiations and advocacy, including in subject specific sessions. We hope you will offer your wholehearted support by nominating delegates to attend the training course. The first gender responsive plenipotentiary in Bucharest in the September provides us with an opportunity to measure our progress. The onus is on us to foster a growing cohort of women delegates representing their countries, taking the floor, advocating, negotiating taking the lead. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Ambassador uh, Gurley, for those uh, inspiring uh, words. Uh, we will now proceed uh, with the signing ceremony of the agreement between uh, Australia and the International Telecommunication uh, Union. Uh, Last year, ITU Council, as mentioned by uh, uh, the, uh, the Ambassador of Australia, uh, decided uh, in the plenipotentiary conference to take place in Bucharest, uh, Romania, from uh, tw uh, 26 September to 14 October 2022, uh, be a gender res responsive event. Subsequently, Australia reached out to ITU with a proposal to contribute to increasing the participation of women delegates during the conference and, and also to strengthen the work on closing the gender digital divide. Today, on Women's International Day, the Government of Australia and ITU will sign a memorandum of understanding to enhance the capacity of women delegates to participate effectively in the plenipotentiary conference. I am pleased to announce that Australia, as mentioned, will be funding training delivered through the ITU Acad Academy platform to support women delegates attending PP22 and sponsor a networking event 
to take place in Bucharest may invite uh, Thank you. Congratulations on the signing of this MOU and best wishes for a fruitful collaboration. Thank you. I will now give the floor uh, to Mr. Sabine Sarmas, Chairman Designated of Plenipotentiary Conference uh, Bucharest 2022 to say a few words. Mr. Sabine, please. Mr. Secretary General, Madam Ambassador, distinguished guests, first just uh, allow me to wish a happy International Women's Day to all the ladies present here. Maybe we are not doing this too often or as often as we should, but um, we, men, thank you all of you for your do-it approach and for the grace you are solving all the challenges you are facing each day. Thank you for this. Uh, beside this, I think that I would like to say that in, uh, events or organizing events like, like this one are extremely important things that are, are done by countries that are leading, as you are doing, and I, I saw a lot in your speech, that you are leading this process of creating gender equality in, uh, in, uh, in your country, in the ITU community, in the world in general. So congratulations for, the, for that and thank you for having such an event and for inviting uh, us here today. We spent maybe too many years uh, speaking about gender equality and maybe not taking as much action as we do. So I think that real measurements have to be taken today and every day that follows uh, I don't know, the, the events like one, one we're having here today. Uh, that's why, as I said, WISE initiative uh, and signing this agreement today, it's um, very important and congratulations again for, for having this event. Uh, training women to be ready for the challenges of IT and C, it's a valuable thing for the future of industry. We are facing today very rapidly world of work changes. It's something that we never faced before. The way that the new jobs are creating, it's evolving extremely, extremely fast and we, we need to be ready for this. And I think the woman inclusion in this sector is a key for sustainable economic growth in the end, if we are going deeper in the subject. Furthermore, I think that it's extremely important not only to solve existing problems of the gender inequality, but also to set the ground for a series of strategies that are meant to empower and to offer them the appropriate skill and tools which are, uh, more and more which are more and more digital today and to help them strengthen the, their position as decision making in the communication and the workplace, in the communities, I'm sorry, and, and workplaces. I'm thus very confident that the women expertise will play a crucial role in uh, ITU activity and of course, in upcoming plenipotentiary conference that Romania is hosting and where we are more than welcome next year. As the designated chairman of the PP, it's both uh, my pleasure and uh, my goal to encourage, to have a delegation to be gender balanced. Maybe some of you had the chance to meet my team and you saw that I'm trying to lead by example here and I think I'm pretty successful in this. And uh, besides this training and courtesy to the Australian delegation, uh, the host country, Romania, uh, has prepared a series of uh, gender equality focus events, which will be an excellent opportunity to promote the gender, uh, gender uh, equality, further to uh, advocate for uh, women leadership in the roles uh, of uh, telecommunication industry. So thank you very much for this again, and good luck with all your with your project and hope it's going to be a very, very successful side event of our PP in Romania. Thank you again. Thank you very much.
thank you very much, Mr. Salmas, for your excellent speech. Uh, I hope that the plenipotentiary conference in uh, Bucharest will be very successful and will produce uh, fruitful outcomes. Moving uh, on the next agenda item, I would now uh, like to invite Dr. Chisabli, the director of uh, the Standardization Bureau of the ITU, to give us his opening remarks. The floor is yours. Thank you. Very good afternoon, Excellency Ministers, Ambassadors, uh, Secretary General, uh, fellow elected officers. Let me say welcome and congratulations of International Women's Day. Uh, see, still in this floor, some of we need uh, gender balance. I hope that uh, I too, we are as an international organization, we are really strive to the most, uh, the, uh, most inclusive organization for the gender equality. We are strive to have uh, inclusivity as much as possible. So inclusivity does not mean the only developed or developing regions, or this region, that region, all geographical regions, including women and uh, all genders. Uh, by, tech, uh, by nature, technical standard is not gender biased, but we are a little bit worried about current standard might be because most many of technical standard developed by the male side, male attendance. So we may possibly something missing. Our technical standard may be not proper in terms of this. Uh, uh, supporting of this gender equality. So we are looking for that. So I think we are looking for that of this uh, as a, one of our subject. We just started, but we try to look at of this. Our current recommendation is enough to support the, the uh, gender equality. Definitely our future subject should be included of that. I have been informed of this uh, last study period. We have uh, uh, women participation is 17%. But now, this study period, we have 27 percent. The Secretary General informed us WTSA is 30 percent. So I'm very hope to the next study period should be over 30, 35 percent to reach uh, real gender equality. I have this, especially our Excellency, this uh, Ambassador indicate about AI, machine learning, there might be a certain Biased, should not be biased, but I'm very happy we have a, a keynote speech after me, or this, uh, the, after this excellence of this uh, minister, we have a keynote speech about new algorithmic divide, delivered by uh, Professor Anya uh, Susala. I thank of this uh, Professor Anya Susala. This is a subject how we can ensure AI algorithms be uh, balanced. So I hope this will be interesting subject for us, how we get reminded of this issue that could be subject to our continuous development through this ITU uh, in terms of this technical standard. I conclude, I wish to conclude as a, my thanks to our chairman, uh, Madam Rim. She already stayed with us more than 10 years, now became of this one of study group vice chair is her activity is expanded to the regional group in Africa. And also uh, my thanks to Mr. Kim as a uh, uh, have participate as a male side, how we can contribute to this uh, gender equality. Thank you very much. I wish you have a great uh, event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee, for your inspiring remarks. We, we are very privileged to also have in our Mitset, Her Excellency, Mrs. Minette Libom Lee Likeng, the Minister of Post and Telecommunication of Cameroon, who will also give us some few remarks. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for recognizing me. 
Let me first of all thank the Secretary General of the ITU for inviting me to take part in this important round table discussion on ICT development and gender issues in standardization. I believe that more than even before, stakeholders need to integrate gender perspective into their various ICT strategies in order to speed up progress towards gender equality. In developing economies inclusive of Cameroon, there is clear evidence of gender inequality with regard to access and production of ICT services largely associated to cultural norms that are discriminatory toward girls and women, as well with lack of women within the circles where ICT's issues are designed and controlled particularly at policy levels. In our communi communities, low literacy and skill levels, poverty and lack of affordability or access to services and cultural norms that bar women from having access to electronic communication have been identified as the main factor that inhibits women and girls from playing key roles in ICT development. Consequently, governments should start by working to overcome this obstacle through appropriate policy initiatives in order to ensure equitable gender access. In Cameroon, the role of women in economic development is largely celebrated and delineated in a gender policy document which informs government actions in line with the head of state's vision for the promotion of the status of women and the construction of an exemplary republic based on the equal rights of citizens of both sexes. As far as the telecommunication sector is concerned, the following initiatives have been undertaken to encourage women and young girls in the fields of ICT, encourage the ownership of ICT access devices by women and girls, support female entrepreneurship and women startups, encourage uptake of training courses in the field of ICT, mandate the issue the use of ICT resources, including social media platforms, to fight against all forms of violence and discrimination against women, including hate speech, radicalization, and bullying. Provide scholarship award for academic excellence to girls. Undertake concrete initiatives to establish a genuine and gender-balanced ecosystem for the development of digital companies and access to ICT jobs. Standardization has played and will continue to play a critical role in the development of telecommunication globally. Despite being highly technical and male-dominated, I believe that if women are given the chance and right opportunities, they will contribute significantly. Recruitment into the Standardization Bureau and related industry bodies must take into consideration gender-specific issues. Before the validation of standards, it is important to ensure that each standard is gender-responsive. The voice of a woman must not only be championed by women, I'm hereby appealing to all the men within the standardization ecosystem to stand up for the women when formulating and implementing standards. To the few women who are already in standard organization, I invite you to work even harder to mentor upcoming female talents and above all, to ensure that your voices are heard and deleted in every future standard. It is also important to ensure that both women and men participating in standard setting processes are adequately resourced to consider both the basic needs and the long-term motive of all gender in the era of standardization in which they operate. For us, 
At the Ministry of ICTs in Cameroon, we have embedded gender-specific initiatives in all our programs, such as the appointment of women into positions of authority and the integration of women in the elaboration of key policy documents, which are all in line with the directives of the heads of state. We are also working with our international partners to found gender initiatives in all our projects. Our motto is that no one will be left behind, not the boy child and not even the girl child. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your uh, enriching remarks. I would now uh, like to invite Professor Anjana Suzarla to give us a keynote speech on the new algorithmic divide, understanding gender bias and fairness with artificial intelligence. Prof Professor Anjana Suzarla will participate remotely. Just to introduce Professor Anjana Suzarla, uh, she's uh, the Omura Saxena Professor of Responsible AI at the Elibold College of Business at Michigan State University. Her research interested includes the economics of information systems, social media analytics, and the economics of artificial intelligence. Professor Su Suzarla, the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes for your presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so delighted uh, to be able to uh, speak to you, uh, although remote. Um, I'm so traditionally, I think most of you have heard this, um, the, the term, the digital divide. There is a gap between those who could access computers and the internet and those who could not. Now with algorithms controlling almost every part of our lives, there is likewise an algorithmic, uh, an algorithmic divide. And today I wanna to talk a little bit about how gender inequities can be magnified or accentuated by the algorithmic divide. I wanna talk a little bit about how how to ensure fairness and gender equity with AI, and what are the role that standards can play in greater inclusion. So what is really causing the algorithmic divide? It's really because we are increasingly physical and virtual are merging. There is a ubiquity of artificial intelligence and predictive analytics, and AI that used to be used for more automation type tasks is being used increasingly for higher order reasoning and perception. That means every aspect of our life, what route we take in our morning commute to more complex legal and judicial matters, such as predictive policing or credit lending, etc., everything is controlled by algorithms. That means that we are increasingly defining and recognizing people, objects, and connections through the lens of predictive algorithms. So algorithms take in data, they fit them to a mathematical model and put out a prediction. Doesn't matter what songs you enjoy or it could be how many years someone should spend in jail. So the models and develop, are developed and tweaked based on past data. So what that means is that the assumptions and biases underlying algorithms affect our broader participation in economic activity and in society. And a number of speakers have already alluded to that in the, uh, in the, in the past few minutes. So what, what is contributing to gender inequities in the age of the algorithmic divide? First, as some of you have already mentioned, AI, the growth of AI is typically taking place in in, in areas such as engineering, where there are traditionally not that many women. Also, roles typically filled by women, such as administrative and customer service roles, are being automated away by new technologies. And so the talent base of women can be very small in the higher paying, higher remunerative jobs, and in the jobs that, the jobs that call for design thinking, 
when it comes to artificial intelligence. The other thing that's happening is AI is shaping the future of work in a way that could be adverse to gender inequality, gender equality. Because what the jobs that could be hardest to automate can be caregiving roles, such as ones uh, that require looking after children or elderly care. But those, again, may be very racialized and gendered in a way that does not help uh, the, the, the people doing those jobs to share from the gains in society in an equitable manner. And the third is the idea of data deserts. Girls and women have less access to technology and the internet. So a lot of AI systems may be used uh, unthinkingly, they are unthinkingly created without taking the lives of women into consideration. And there's, there's a lot of data deserts. There's just not enough data about how women are using in technology and participating in economics. So what do we do? Can we, how do we understand fairness and bias? First, we need an understanding that there is such a thing as algorithmic harms. To understand gender biases in AI, we only have to look at digital assistants, whether it's Alexa or Siri. Almost all voice assistants are given female names and express personalities that are engineered to be uniformly subservient. A UNESCO report on gender inequality and AI explains that these biases are rooted in stark gender imbalances in digital skills education and exacerbated by the gender imbalances of teams that are developing these AI tools. So what can we do to implement AI in an equitable, trustworthy, and transparent manner? We need mechanisms to correct for biases. Individuals, firms, governments, and standard setting bodies should be actively aware of how AI reinforces biases, create curriculum, look for partnerships between citizens and standard making bodies. And I will talk a little bit about some of these algorithmic harms. A very famous example, uh, at least in the United States, is that of a couple who both applied for Apple credit cards. They make the same, more or less same income, and they live in an a common property state of California, wife was given a credit limit of little less, less than half of what her husband was given. And similarly, another example, an AI of an audit of an AI tool used for lending basically revealed that almost all approved loans were for male borrowers, reflecting the fact that loan offer officers historically favored male applicants. So algorithmic governance posed differential costs to different groups. Using AI and mortgage processing may be efficient for a firm, for a bank, but in the process, is AI placing undue burdens on different groups of individuals? So we need to quantify what would be algorithmic harm from an individual perspective and a societal perspective, like differential access to job opportunities, differential access to health equity or education equity, et cetera and to build gender smart AI to advance gender equi equity, recognize, we need to first recognize that there are different algorithmic harms and we need to connect those algorithmic harms to gender equity outcomes that we want to see in society. So to understand standards for inclusion, first we need a typology of algorithmic harms, needs to happen at policy making bodies need to consider this, governments need to consider, and companies need to consider this as well. There are a variety of rules and regulations almost all over the world. This is a matter of active debate. How do we regulate AI? And for standards for inclusion need to consider the impacts of artificial intelligence on different aspects of our lives. I would call it essentially two different things. One, we encounter algorithms when we consume goods and services. And conversely, our participation in the broader workforce is also mediated by algorithms. So I would say there is algorithmically mediated consumption and algorithmically mediated production. And we need to understand racial and gender biases, both with existing systems, but also in the newer forms of technology. For instance, there is a lot of hype about some of the web 3.0 emerging models, such as metaverse, blockchains, digital currencies, smart cities, but if there's data deserts where we don't consider the lives of women and we build smart cities, 
then essentially we are ignoring the context of women's participation in economic activity. So there should be bias correcting mechanisms at every aspect of our lives. I would say the other thing that we should actively consider is consider the sustainable development goals that we want gender equality underlies all of these that there should be no poverty no hunger that everyone has needs access to good water clean sanitation high quality education and decent grow, work and economic growth prospects if we all understand that these are common societal outcomes that we should strive towards understanding first algorithmic harms understanding bias correcting mechanisms. So standard making bodies need to be actively aware of how these responsible development of responsible artificial intelligence, which I would say is artificial intelligence that is human centric, that is trustworthy, that's inclusive, that considers privacy and data safeguards, data access rights and privacy and Artificial intelligence, that's also not just a black box artificial intelligence, but it needs to be explainable. Every aspect of the sustainable development goals, when we use technologies such as mobile and online health information portals, or when we have food security through a lot of uh, apps that people use, or when companies invest in work and economic growth models, all of these need to consider the context of women's rights. There's so many examples where needs of women are routinely overlooked. Most famous example, I think, is the first Apple Health Kit, which tracked pretty much every body function except uh, women's menstrual cycles. So these are clearing examples where needs of women were not met by industry and standard making bodies and governments have a big role to play in ensuring gender parity by at least setting standards to enable quantification of algorithmic harms. Likewise, with a lot of Internet of Things initiatives, unless we take into context women's lives and that women may have special safety and consideration needs when they step out of their homes in many parts of the world, we cannot have inclusive development and safe smart cities and so forth. So AI and standards of inclusion, as I said, the, every aspect of uh, what I would call as a principle of responsible artificial intelligence, that artificial intelligence should be inclusive, it should be explainable, it should be trustworthy, it needs human agency and oversight, and we need to safeguard privacy and data rights. All these need to consider gender needs and gender equity at every step of the way. In a lot of cases, we see diversity, equity, and inclusion being discussed as something very separate from gender bias in artificial intelligence. But unless we understand that these are very integrated and they go together, such as inclusive data gathering methods, audits of fairness standards with gender inclusion as a norm, explanations for use of AI rooted in gender equity, awareness of how algorithmic accountability or algorithmic harms is disadvantaging the lives of women. And once we need to understand how human agency and oversight when dealing with lives of the disadvantaged and vulnerable people. So maybe they are migrant women who face double disadvantage in being from a migrant community and say, uh, also being women and navigating things like the COVID pandemic, unless we design technology to include the needs of all these uh, different categories of uh, needs of uh, people, then we cannot have sustainable goals, uh, development goals that are met. So roughly, I would say some standards of inclusion would be we need more awareness and algorithmic literacy. The example I have this picture, it's a concept developed by the MIT Media Lab. It's about how even middle graders, as young as middle grade students, can be introduced to the concept of algorithmic harms and AI ethics. So this is asking students to reimagine design of popular apps sorry, like sorry, YouTube. Sorry, Professor Susarla, because we have a constraint yeah. of time. Can you conclude yeah. in one minute, please? Thank yeah. you very much. I'm, 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 I'm so almost sorry done. for that. Thank you. This Thank is you. my last slide. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
So this is, you know, I would conclude by saying we need codes of conduct for AI developers. And, and that's, that's, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Susarla, for your excellent presentation that highlight how gender-related algorithm business impact women's participation in economic activity and society and discusses mechanism to address gender equality in AI and how to implement AI in an equ equitable, trustworthy and transparent manner. It also discusses systems and processes by which we can uh, usure in standards for inclusion through AI. I would like to ask the floor if there is any question regarding uh, the keynotes delivered by Professor Susarla. Due to the time limitation, we can take only one question, if any. Thank you very much. So no question from the floor. Thank you very much, Professor Susarla, for your very interesting presentation. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Mrs. Florence uh, Tunzi to give us a report on gender in ITOT. Mrs. Tunzi is the gender focal point for TSB IT ITOT. She coordinates all gender-related matters, including the implementation of ITOT Resolution 55 on gender equality and empowerment, as well as the activities of FISE. Mrs. Tunsi, the floor is yours. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm, please, I'm pleased to present to you a brief report on gender in ITUT and TSB. Gender has always been an important part of ITUT and TSB. 14 years ago, the first resolution on gender was implemented by WTSA in Johannesburg calling for men, a mainstreaming in ITUT activities and also empowerment of women. ITUT Resolution 55 has since been updated every four years, in 2012, 2016, and this WTSA, to ensure alignment with the changing needs and trend in the ICT standardization sector. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a saying that what gets measured gets done. In alignment with the various uh, resolution of, uh, uh, on gender, TSB has been tracking progress to, empower, to ensure more action are taken to promote gender equality and the empowerment of women. And here are the key findings. So in, t in terms of uh, participation of women in ITUT statutory meeting, we see that there has been in an increase slowly but surely uh, currently in the current study period at 26%. As you can see here, we have, uh, it's been going up from 14% to 17 and currently at 26%. We also see that in previous WTSA, it has been progressively going up and reporting today that in this WTSA, we have 30% women who have attended this WTSA. On the other hand, in terms of uh, non-statutory event, we see that numbers are higher. For example, when you look at the numbers for AI for Good, we see that participation of women and also um, speakers in the event are roughly 35%. And same thing for smart cities. In terms of leadership positions in ITUT working groups, the number of female chairmen and vice chair has been stable between 15 and 20 percent over the years. There's still work to be done. Looking at data uh, by study group, this uh, leadership position in study group, we see that 
the more technical the topic of the study group, the less women we have in our leadership positions. We have also tracked uh, data on fellowship because TSP management has gender as a priority when awarding fellowships. And in the current study, study period, the numbers are 24%. Last but not least, staffing. So currently, 53% uh, of TSP staff are women. While we see that more women are in the general services category, TSP management has also made it a priority to promote women in higher grades in the professional category. However, so currently the number of women in the professional category is at 45%, and this is a big increase over the last 10 years. However, as we move up the ladder from grade P4 and above, we see that it's uh, currently dominated by the male population. So there's work to be done as well. So what can we do? What can we do to increase the number of women participating in ITT activities? What can we do to increase the number of, of women in leadership positions? What can we do to ensure that we have 50-50 participation at the next WTSA or WTSA 28? It's a collective effort, and here are some proposals for your consideration. For example, member states can be submitting more candidatures of women in the leadership positions, vice chair and chair, and rapporteurs or nominate women as heads of delegations. Sector members may also consider nominating women as speakers to I2T events. And internally in TSB, we can increase the number of women at P4 grade and above, and also implement tools to track more progress because we have the capacity. And collectively, we can strengthen partnership with other standard development organizations to promote gender equality in the sector. Thank you and happy International Women's Day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Tunsi, for giving a very comprehensive report highlighting the important effort undertaken by ITU to promote active participation, contribution, and leadership of women in all aspects of ITUT activities and processes. Now, I would like to welcome Dr. Chi Sabli, the director of TSB, to recognize individuals who have made remarkable contributions to the ITUT standardization works in terms of impact continuity and leadership. Dr. Lee, the floor is yours. Uh, as we have some of uh, uh, Mr. Fl uh, Madam Floor is uh, indicated, so we did uh, some of our uh, progress of this, our effort to have uh, more women leadership. As you saw this, the technical domain is uh, rather difficult, still difficult to, to get us uh, women leadership, but we have uh, certain areas having recognized this women's participation, like uh, RIM, you did a great job. And also, we, this is not only from the uh, well-developed regions, developed countries. Also, we have a very good uh, participation from the developing region as well. So uh, this is a moment I have to uh, recognize of their contribution to the activities uh, for our standard development. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so 
have a, a, a list of this name here. I, I'm not quite sure everybody, uh, s someone will be uh, joined by remote, I guess, but just recognize the name, uh, take into account uh, on uh, uh, limited time. Madam Xu Guang Chi uh, from China, People's Republic of China, as we, rec we wish to recognize as her leadership. She did great contributions to lead one of our study groups, study group five, last two years as acting chair. Study group five is the group for uh, environmental aspect, including the uh, electromagnetic field areas. Very technology oriented, but also taking into account environmental aspect. And the second recognition is uh, uh, Madam uh, Mio Naganuma. She is an, uh, from Japan. Is also recognized by the leadership. She is an expert of IT, uh, security, cyber security domain, and she is a rapporteur quite long years. And now she's became of the TSEC one of vice chairman to address of this our uh, security subject. And another lady is Wei Ling Shu, this People's Republic of China. She started her activity in the one of our study group, but she served more than two terms in our uh, advisory group as a vice chairman. So her contribution is related how we can inclusive of when he set up our standard development strategy, she always there. So uh, we recognize uh, her activities as a continuity of this, our activities. And uh, next is the, uh, Tania Marcos Paramio as a Kingdom of Spain. Uh, so recognized as a continuity, as, uh, she also continued this, our, her activity to help us to address a smart city subject and those uh, other uh, development of our standard works. She is uh, uh, one of the, uh, I think she is one of our rapporteurs and was a focal point of this, our activities. And next should be the, I think it's the dream again. Uh, Rim from Republic of Tunisia, uh, Rim uh, Bel Hassan uh, Sharif. She is the vice chair of the study group 13th. Uh, she worked in the telecom, uh, Tunisia uh, Telecom, but is an uh, expert for the network aspect of this. So quite well linked with her professional life into uh, our standard works. Uh, lastly, but not least, was Nevin uh, Tofik. I think she's here. No. Remotely, yeah, I think. So uh, from Arab Republic of uh, Egypt, she has an impact or this uh, the, uh, impact to the, our uh, standard development. She had quite good uh, contributions for all our uh, discussions, especially the, our strategy discussions. She always bring the women's perspective and uh, many uh, insightful uh, ideas to us. So that is what I want to recognize as our contributors. I wish that the uh, planning potentially we have uh, more and more women uh, recognized definitely next WTSA. We definitely we wish to have more uh, women experts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I would like uh, to convene my sincere thanks and profound gratitude to you, uh, Mr. Chisabli, and uh, to TSB for this important uh, nomination, as well as for your continuous support uh, and encouragement. It's a great honor to have this nomination, and I feel proud uh, to be part of the ITOT family. Thank you, Dr. Lee, and congratulations to the winners. You truly deserve it, this honor. Now, delving into the heart of today's discussion, this panel session will cover why gender matters in, in setting standards. I would like to invite our distinguished panelists to the podium. I would like to welcome our distinguished panelist, Dr. Hyung Jun Kim, the Vice Chairman of WISE. Please, can you join us? I ask also Mrs. Christina Fluture, the Director of International Affairs at uh, Ancom Romania, Please, can you... who are joining us in the room uh, and uh, 
they are uh, par they are participating uh, remotely to this panel discussion. There are Mrs. Anne Rachel Ine, the ITU Regional Director for uh, Africa, Mrs. Miho Naganuma, Principal Strategic at NEC Corporation Japan, and Mrs. Nevin Taufiq, Senior Expert at the Ministry of Communication and Information Technology of Egypt. While providing a snapshot of the gender issues in standardization, the session will also provide a sneak peek into the future course of collaborative action for gender issues and inclusive at the international level. It is indeed here turning to see experts representing different ICT key players take the center stage to engage in fruitful dialogue that will impact the way we embarrass gender equality and fairness in the future. For this panel session, we plan to have two rounds of questions, if time allows. Each distinguished panelist is kindly invited to provide his response within three minutes, and the remote panelists are kindly invited to switch on their webcams when taking the floor. So, to learn more, more without any delay, I would like to hand the floor to our first panelist, Mrs. Miho Naganuma. She will uh, participate remotely. Uh, just to introduce uh, shortly Mr. Mrs. Miho Naganuma, uh, she has over 20 years experience in the ICT industry. She has developed her career in private sector and has mainly focused on cybersecurity. She's now in NEC Corporation and is responsible for leading intelligent research for policy and regulatory impact on digital trust field, including AI. During her career, she has also been actively involved in international standardization work in many organizations, including ITU, ISO, other SDOs and experts committees for over 20 years. Mrs. Miho, in your view, why it is so important to women nowadays to get involved in setting standards and what are the high value women can obtain from their involvement in the standardization activities? Mr. Miho, thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction and uh, thank you very much for giving me this uh, great opportunity for this fantastic uh, event for the women. Um, and also thank you very much CSB for your recognition to myself. It was very great and <laughs> um, um, surprising. So as I introduced, my name is Mihyo Neganuma. I'm uh, NEC, from NEC Corporation, Corporation based on Japan, Tokyo. So I'm in the private sector. Um, so let me say, uh, let me answer your question. So um, I think this is a very good question. Uh, we need to have some sort of motivation to all women um, to involve in the standardization. To answering the question, um, because I've been in the in this society for many years, over 20 years. So let me let me say that uh, first of all, I really would like to share the fact that. Uh, the standardization activity is very, very international activity. So as you see, in our, even in ITUT, we have uh, um, delegates from quite a number of countries, um, including from the member states and sector member. So, and, uh, we are, and they are quite uh, diverse. So people come from the government, um, industry, the research institute and academia, and also so we have some colleagues from the um, civic societies and etc. So now so, so many women are very much involved in and working in every sector globally. So it is quite natural that the women are uh, involved in such community, including some standardization community from each entities. So we've got a lot of reason to um, women need to be uh, involved in, but the fact here is a lot of women are very much working. Um, well, to be honest and generally speaking, it was true that 
the uh, number of um, women were relatively small in the ICT and the telecom sectors in the past, particularly in the private sector, but now the situation is completely different. So now the situation has really changed and I'm so glad to see that uh, many women, regardless of the gen uh, generation, are participating in the standard activity. So as I mentioned, the ID appreciates the fact that the standardization is um, a very much international activity. So this is the point that I really want to um, see the high value for, um, of the standardization for the all women. You see, quite naturally, networking and human, ne well, human network is going to be your value for each participant. But also, I really want to focus in on some skill issues here. So once you involved in the standardization activity, you are required communication um, through the old processes with the various participants who have different views, even in the same technical field. So sometimes it's quite tough having some communication or some negotiation through the old processes for the standardization is not so easy all the time, but such experience will give you high level value and uh, high level negotiation and communication skills. And also you can understand global perspective with their diversities. Then if you get to the more experienced, um, you can actually take the leadership to the community and that also give you the further skill like uh, leadership skill and also the coordination skill. You see, the women really need to get certain skill in your career and standardization is going to really encourage um, your, car your, your own skill and also your, your career as well. So I believe that more women can enjoy such experiences and it's always to give you the high value to be involved in that activity and you can always find your new world and also new your own skills. So that is a great value for the standardization that exactly I have seen in my career. So that's my, um, I hope that this answers your question. So over to you, Arim. Um, yes. to Thank you. Thank you very response. much, Miho. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your response, which highlights uh, the benefits that uh, women can get from their uh, involvement uh, in uh, setting standards and how they could uh, strengthen their negotiation and communication skills with diverse scope through the processes of setting standardization and take leadership positions. Thank you again. Uh, now let's move to, to our second uh, panelist, uh, Mrs. Anne Rachel Ine. Uh, however, the involvement of uh, women in setting standards uh, could have a much uh, wider impact uh, as it uh, could help uh, achieve the sustainable development goals. This is the purpose of my second question, which I would like to ask uh, to Mrs. Anne Rachel Ine. Just to introduce uh, briefly, uh, Mrs. Anne Rachel Ine uh, is the ITU Regional uh, Director for Africa. She also reserves, uh, serves as liaison to African Union and uh, UNECA prior to joining ITU. She was the senior vice president uh, of uh, government uh, affairs at the American Registry for uh, Internet Numbers and uh, the primary link to governments of US, Canada and more than 25 Caribbean and North Atlantic economy, economies that uh, constitute uh, ARIN's regions uh, and the focal points for uh, international IGO, IO and their work. Mrs. Rachel, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rim. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, happy International Women's Day. Uh, congratulations to uh, one of the ladies who were awarded earlier. This is fantastic to see, and it is also fantastic to hear, you know, the numbers at uh, an ITU level. Uh, we're still not there at 30%. We absolutely need to do much, much better. And it will take, uh, you know, all of us to do it together. Um, the involvement of women in standards is um, not new, but thank God, you know, we're making a lot more strides in there. 
it is important to understand that um, standards are part of our life. Standards are part of social development. Standards are part of, um, you know, everything that we do every day. So we can't just think about having standards that only respond to 50% of humanity, that the other 50% would be left on the, bunk, on the bench, you know? It is important that women participate. We've seen it when, um, uh, you know, one of our keynote speakers talked about how AI can be misinformed by standards because they do not have the, you know, the, the little uh, uh, touches that come from, uh, in fact, women. From, uh, you know, I come from a developing country and I can tell you, from uh, uh, you know drinking water uh, all the way to uh, uh, sustainable environment to um, uh, you know sustainable livelihoods in families, uh, if we do not have women informed and we do not have women part of setting the standards, we actually leave half of the knowledge on the floor because. Um, Believe it or not, I mean, my grandmother was the one who taught me, for example, you know, how to clean, uh, you know, water with uh, uh, moringa seeds, all right? So, uh, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of things that we definitely, honestly, on a, on a daily basis do, but that we do not think are informed by our own behaviors. And when standards are only informed by, I would say, male behavior, then they basically turn the same way, you know, out there in society, meaning, you know, harmful to the half of us. So it is important that we really understand that, uh, you know, women being part of this process are going to definitely is going to you know help us achieve uh, sustainable development goals. I mean, all we, we cannot achieve the 17 of them without women. We're half of humanity, and we have to be part of the process of digital transformation, the process of uh, social transformation globally. And there is no way this is going to change. So uh, we need to make sure that uh, girls are not only going into STEM, but they also have this team to do it. Because believe it or not, I mean, an informed standards that, you know, that, that, is, that, that is done via critical thinking is a lot more useful to all of us than just one that is done the technical way. So thank you very much, Rin. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel, for uh, your clear response. Uh, uh, I have another uh, question for you, Rachel. How could the involvement of women in setting standards uh, help achieve the sustainable development goals? Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear my question or uh, um, can I repeat? Can you repeat? Thank you. Yes, thank you. How could the involvement of women in setting standards help achieve the SDGs? Um, so this is where, again, you know, um, opening up standard organizations to, you know, females is definitely very important. A lot of our speakers from the... Uh, you know, the Secretary General of ITU to all of the, everybody who has spoken before has said, you know, it is important that women participate in all standard setting organizations. I have worked in a few that, uh, you know, that have, um, uh, that have the privilege of uh, doing standards for um, a lot of um, uh, what we call the internet and the global internet today. And I can tell you that there aren't that many of us, but each one of these organizations has recognized over the years from, uh, you know, the most technical ones to the ones that are on doing, doing the daily job, that it is important. It is truly important that we get women 
in those settings, not only to be part of the work of setting the standards, but also working with them, because it is important. You know, there is this, this subtlety of, um, of, uh, of uh, one of the things that we've been doing for the past few years is making sure that the technical communities are talking to, you know, the regular folks and the regular folks are talking to the technical community. Well, I, I have to say that, you know, wherever, again, okay, being a bit biased, uh, but hey, uh, I have to say, wherever it's been with, uh, you know, one of uh, a lot of my women colleagues, you know, um, we tend to navigate into, oh, how has this been helpful or not? And how has this, um, you know, not helped us that much? Instead of just thinking about, oh, this is what the standard is supposed to do. This is what it's going to do. And not think about, you know, uh, things like, you know, biases in human rights. You know, uh, today, just, just to tell you, I mean, um, one of the things that I discovered, an anecdote, one of the things that I discovered during, during COVID, my uh, niece and my daughter had COVID in July 2020. And we went to um, uh, the, uh, how do you say, the, the clinic. And we discovered, you know, something that I had no idea about, which is that simply, you know, the oximeter doesn't read oxygen properly, you know, in, uh, in brown people. It is one of the biases that exists, okay? Some of the others are just simple cognitive biases. Once I was a meeting, you know, one of the, the guys who was coming to the meeting came in and because I was at the door with one of my colleagues, he just, you know, gave us his, um, his, uh, his, his coat to hand. You know, so whether it's technical standards, whether it is, you know, uh, the daily life standards for our own social development, we need to understand that, you know, um, it is important that uh, women are part of this process. This one person who came and gave us his coat because he thought we were ushers, because we were, you know, two of the only ladies that were around, um, th this is something that is somewhat of a built-in cognitive standard that he has because he's a male and because it, it, is a, it was a, a technical organization and because he thought, yeah, there aren't supposed to be that many ladies, you know. So it is truly, really important that, um, you know, women are given their places in standard setting organizations because we belong, we can do the job, and, uh, you know, we can actually help make it better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Rashan, for your response, uh, highlighting the interesting role that the women can play in achieving uh, SDG uh, uh, through uh, their involvement in the standardization activities. Thank you. However, Getting women involved in the process of the standards development is not an easy task as women may face many challenges and barriers. I invite you uh, to know more about this issue with Dr. Hyun Jun Kim. Dr. Kim joined the electronic uh, the ETRI in uh, 1988 and he is currently in charge uh, uh, of the Intelligence Convergence Research Lab uh, in Etri, a senior vice president. He has had about 33 years research experiences in various divisions of Etri, including Info Communications Technology Division, IT Strategy Research Division, Information Telecommunication Technology Division, and Protocol Engineering Center. He has been currently serving as vice chair of ITUT study group 20 and its co-chair of working party two, and the co-convener of the joint coordination activity on internet of things and smart cities and communities under study group 20. So Dr. Kim, what are in your opinion, the main challenges for getting women involved in the process of standards developments? Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Lim. Uh, the Madam Chairperson. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Yihang Jun Kim. I'm work for Atri. Uh, I'm from Harvey Park, North Korea. Uh, before the answer, yes, my, my, my answer will be quite short uh, because we are running out of time. But um, the, uh, I would like to give some uh, good memory of the the, the uh, Madam Chairperson. I had very good memory uh, to, uh, to work together with the team at the uh, uh, ITUT study of 13. Uh, I myself and the team, uh, we were the co vice chair of the study of 13 in ITUT. Uh, we had a very good experience and we had very good memory to work together with uh, uh, together uh, for the standard development. So until I moved to uh, another study, which is the study of play. So I'm very honored, I'm very glad to be here with all of you uh, as a representative from May, <laughs> not as a female, but anyway, okay, I would like to give uh, the answer uh, for uh, your question. But uh, the considering uh, its importance of gender equality or the gender balance uh, in standard developments, I have prepared uh, my uh, statement today to more focus on this session and better uh, deliver myself to a lot of you. In my humble opinion, it's all about professional competence in standard development, whether you are a woman or uh, man. The evolution of telecommunication ICT and emerging technology has allowed everybody to access the information they want. Nevertheless, based on my long time environment here in ITT, the main challenges for getting women Involved in standards development world, when most experts who participate in standards meeting had been male. So although I've seen more and more a woman experts joining to ITU a team meeting recently, the majority is still a male. So although there are more and more the competent women professionals in telecommunications ICT, the underlying prejudice of a standardization is more suitable to men create a kind of barrier. So for example, there is no significant gender gap in Korea in terms of access to ICT infrastructure and services and digital skills. But there remain difficulties for women in terms of career development in ICT or STEM. So, and there is a string an imbalance between the woman and men in ICT industry. So this stereotype do not exist only in Korea. So young women and girls around the world, uh, this uh, proportion of nature are discouraged from studying subjects like ICT and STEM who are pursuing careers in this field as others. So this would be a quick answer from myself. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. Uh, it was a pleasure to working uh, with you uh, in study group 13 and you are uh, my best friend and uh, we have a good relationship till now and uh, I am really happy to work with you and thank you very much for highlighting those uh, challenges uh, which are uh, unfortunately discouraging uh, or even preventing women for getting involved in the process of setting uh, standards. Thank you very much. So now uh, to have uh, another view on uh, this issue, mainly from women perspective, and uh, with focus on developing countries, I would like to ask the same question to Mrs. Neven Taufiq. Mrs. Neven Taufiq uh, worked for several years uh, as uh, instructor of political science and has also been working for the past uh, 30 years in the field of international relations, research, policy, studies, and strategic thinking. She is currently senior international relations expert at the Ministry of Communication and Information Technology. So, Mr. Nevin, what are the main challenges for getting women involved in the process of standards development according to your experience? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reem. And uh, thank you again for uh, ITU for actually the recognition. Uh, I was very touched and really humbled by uh, this uh, gesture. Uh, I have to say, before talking about what I consider the challenges for women 
uh, in standardization that um, I had maybe a different experience in standardization. I don't uh, come from the STEM background. I come more from the social sciences, although I've been working for long years in the Ministry of Communication Information Technology. My involvement in the standardization came actually by coincidence, but I recall that quite well 10 years ago when I started my first meeting at the uh, ITU in standardization in study group five, that as soon as I um, attended the first meeting, I simply felt that, wow, this is really what I would like to work on. And um, one of the reasons is because uh, standardization is really so much focused. They have such an impact on the policy space, on, of course, on the different aspects of our policy space in the SDGs, uh, in the different SDGs, but they are also, uh, they are a really force uh, for good in uh, societies and they ensure that products, services and processes work as intended and thus would have a, an enormous impact on economic growth, trade and the protection of health and safety. And as uh, Andra Shell has mentioned, we're not just talking about the very, very purely technical standard, but of course, uh, about all types of uh, standards as well. The methodology of working in standards has been really an eye-opener for me and has been very, very appealing. The rigorous methodology, the rules, the procedures, the content, in addition, actually, to the international setup, uh, the dialogue, the negotiations that are taking place with the different stakeholders. Uh, so... Um, the, this appeal of standards has really changed a lot in me, and it has also impacted the work that I'm doing also in my ministry in, uh, in Egypt. The whole methodology has really impacted the way uh, I work, and I'm very grateful uh, for that. Uh, why would uh, women really, um, what are the challenges that we face women in the domain of standardization? As you mentioned, Rima, I come from a developing country. And I think that um, the stereotypes are still affecting us to a large extent. It is true that women uh, can and aspire to reach positions of uh, in policy making, in decision making, in all the professions. But I think that we still need to do some more work in the area of standardization. Uh, not just the standardization body need to be proactive in involving more women, but I think that it is a two-way dialogue. We need also to advocate, as women, we need to advocate the importance of standardization in our daily life in a way to disseminate the message among women. And we need also to convey or maybe to relay our personal stories because really standard making is a long process. It's a rigorous process. It's a tedious and it is quite a difficult process that takes a long time. But we need maybe to highlight uh, the benefits of working in this particular uh, field of work. So one of the challenges is that I think that women do not know enough about the impact of standardization on our lives nowadays, and that we need to do an effort in that. In, a, in addition, of course, to the different challenges that have need, uh, been mentioned actually uh, by previous speakers. Another important challenge is the need for capacity building and mentorship. And I'm very happy about the, the MOU that has been signed today uh, between Australia and ITU for uh, raising capacities of women, because this is much needed, not only in um, expertise in the technical area, but also in the soft skills that are necessary in the process of standard making. But in addition to capacity building, I would say that mentoring is extremely important. And I've been really lucky to have excellent mentors, male and female mentors, I would say maybe more male mentors, who have been uh, actually teaching me one-to-one -one on how to approach this uh, big, um, big, big box of standardization, how to start working, how to move this one step at a time. And um, I'm doing this, I'm trying to do this now uh, with other uh, colleagues or other people. So advocacy, understanding the impact of uh, standards on our daily lives is very, very important. Uh, uh, capacity building and uh, mentorship, I think, are uh, challenges 
that we need to address in attracting more women to this important area of work. Thank you very much, Rim. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nevin, uh, for uh, sharing with us uh, your view and your very rich uh, experience uh, on this matter of challenges and we focus also on developing uh, countries. So in order to overcome these challenges, effective efforts at national, regional and international scales are needed. This, this is the scope of my following question uh, to Mrs. Christina uh, Fluture, uh, following a question that I would like to ask uh, Christina. So Mrs. Christina, just to to introduce you briefly, uh, she joined, joined the, the National Authority for Management and Regulatory in Communication uh, in, uh, in uh, 2012 as an expert in the uh, Unit for International Relations and European Affairs. She has an active role in representing Romania in the ITU and other international fora. Mrs. Christina, how could ICT key players at local, regional, and, and international scales support the involvement of uh, women in the standardization activities? And what could be done by SDOs in these purposes? Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. Thank you for having this event and this panel. I think it's it's very important to be encouraging uh, more women to participate in this, what seems to be very technical and, uh, and in this man's world. Um, in terms of, uh, well, what my previous experience was, I, I started participating in the tea sector in 2013, I think, uh, in study group three, and it has been a really amazing experience. and. I found there uh, many uh, very knowledgeable people, both men and women. Um, I think in terms of what we can do at regional level, uh, also having my hat as a CPT coordination, a coordinator um, and international level, I think this assembly is a very good example of what we can do. So we've seen many regions come, come with proposals to amend the resolution 55. Uh, with concrete steps forward, with uh, uh, encouraging and asking for traineeships and mentorship programs and such very practical methods to encourage more women and uh, to, to have a, a balanced, a proper balanced approach through every level of, of the sector, because we are talking now about women taking the floor and uh, speaking on behalf of their countries or their regions and also taking up leadership positions but to take a leadership position i'm speaking from my own experience i want some training before i want to be sure and self-confident when i go out there and uh, be able to chair a meeting um, so this is this is why we need to take it step by step and i think this is very encouraging also to see the the project uh, for the plenipotentiary conference that is also taking place this year um, to take it step by step gradually uh, we will see many women being encouraged in in this sense and i think we see a, a domino effect when i see a woman in a leadership position being self-confident and managing things very well i feel encouraged myself to take up a leadership position so I think we encourage each other and let's not forget about the, the support of the, of the men that have the experience and also the patience. And thank you very much for that to, <laughs> to encourage us and to support us all the way. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christina, for uh, those interesting recommendations. And ICT key players are invited to, I think, uh, undertake concrete and uh, urgent uh, measures uh, to support women in the standardization field. I would like to continue uh, with you, Christina, for my following question. As you have spoken about uh, the SDO's uh, role in supporting women in standardization, and to ask you what kind of assistance 
or measures could be further requested from ITOT to support women's involvement in the standardization process, taking into account uh, the significant effort of ITU in general and ITOT in particular for this purpose. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and yes, well, the, the ITU is a family and we have the, the three sectors and we are now uh, here for the standardization sector uh, highest body of, of uh, decision, decision making body. Uh, and throughout the, uh, throughout the union, we can see in every sector um, all of these networks of women that are uh, raising and probably they will go up to the plenipotentiary level, which is the, the highest level, of course, of the union. Um, I think these, this is a year, of course, because of the pandemic, we had to plan for three conferences in one year, one after the other, three months apart. This is very challenging, but also let's take on the opportunity of this. Let's see our actions, how they impact every sector, the T sector, the D sector, and then we go to the uh, umbrella, big umbrella of the plenipotentiary conference. Um, so these steps are, are the proper ones to take. I think people that, women that took leadership positions here, they're encouraged to do so. If, also at the plenipotentiary level, I'm, I'm saying this as a host country, I think uh, I really wish to see a leadership positions in, in the plenipotentiary conference that will be in my uh, home country. Thanks. Thank you very much, Christina, for sharing with us uh, uh, those relevant ideas. And I hope really for you to be a uh, chair uh, participate in the PP or another big event such as WTSA, WTDC. Thank you very much. I would like to have another view uh, on this subject and maybe the view of a high responsible at ITU. So may I ask you, Mrs. Rachel, uh, the same question. Considering the, signif the significant efforts of ITU in general and ITUT in particular to support women's involvement in the standardization process, what kind of assistance or measures could be further requested from ITUT? Thank you, Mr. Rasha. Thank you very much, Rin. Um, I think I would like to actually say that um, uh, it's not only at, uh, at ITUT. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, we have networks of women in, in the three sectors. But what is the most important for me, and uh, I think uh, Levin talked about it, it's the advocacy. You know, it is important for us to also make sure that uh, people understand uh, what the ITU is. Um, the more I go out, the more I realize that, uh, you know, people have no idea what ITU is doing, whether in, you know, the radio communication sector, that is, you know, you can call it the access and connectivity one, uh, in the standard sector, where there is the interoperability that works and, you know, why that is something that is very important, uh, you know, nowadays for uh, all of the equipment that we're using or the development of regulations that actually inform, you know, uh, the use and uh, the work with that equipment, but also uh, even, you know, uh, uh, making of those equipment. So ITUT definitely uh, has, a, a, you know, a responsibility in terms of uh, not only its management, but also our, uh, the people in terms of um, member states that come there to foster to bring women, you know, inside our midst. And on the other side, the same women, but also, you know, helped by ITU and others definitely need to get the message out. You know, um, it is important that um, the, the message is not only learned, but used in terms of, for example, what is it that we can do to foster more appropriation, understanding of standards in this in, in academic myths, for example. You know, there's a lot of young women who are in, uh, you know, universities to this day who are even in uh, 
uh, uh, technical sectors, but have no idea what ITU is or what you know uh, standards are and how to go into that field. So I think the the advocacy for me is really very important. We need you know with ITUT to go out there uh, to not only do this uh, you know for our members, but to also go out and make sure that we reach the youth who. Yes, whether or not, are going to be the ones replacing us here. So it is absolutely important that they're informed. And I think we really should look into how is it that we can take, uh, you know, the knowledge of what ITU is and what it does uh, all the way to, uh, you know, the the regular folks and uh, youth included. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Rashen, for your helpful recommendation which will be certainly captured uh, in the events uh, summary. Uh, now, uh, I would like to invite uh, Mrs. Neven uh, to, to share with us uh, her experience and to tell us uh, what does uh, she learns most uh, as a professional uh, woman uh, during uh, her involvement in standards uh, setting. Mrs. Uh, Neven. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rim. Uh, I think that uh, I, I touch a little bit on what I learned in the standardization uh, bodies at the ITU uh, during uh, the 10 uh, past years. Uh, but I would like to add to that something else, um, uh, that the work of standardization requires a lot of patience and requires a lot of um, uh, uh, respect and uh, understanding of the different uh, cultures. Uh, this is something that I learned uh, quite well, I think, uh, at ITU during our sessions in standard making, uh, uh, being able to communicate, being able to mediate between different players is very important. And it doesn't come automatically. Uh, it comes with practice. And uh, I think that one of the, the places that require that very uh, particularly is standardization bodies. Uh, of course, we don't all share uh, the same language. So there are sometimes difficulties in, uh, in the language. We don't share the same culture and we certainly do not share the same interest all the time. So being able to mediate between these different uh, factors is very important. And I've seen uh, a lot of really great uh, chairs of, uh, of ITU groups doing that. I learned a lot uh, from that. And I think that women in particular, I don't want to use stereotypes, but maybe uh, the patience to be able to mediate with the different stakeholders, uh, to take the dialogue one step at a time with the different people from different backgrounds is something that uh, is very much uh, required. Uh, and is very much uh, in need, uh, needed in uh, standardization work. Um, another thing that I learned is really to keep going. But sometimes uh, this work is not, does not lead to immediate actions. And this is particularly clear in issues that are, are quite controversial. Uh, so it is very important to keep going, persistence, trying different ways, trying different solutions, trying different approaches, Okay, using all your skills, whether the research, whether the expertise, whether the mediation, the negotiations, but keep going even if the process is long uh, and uh, sometimes tiresome. Um, the other thing is uh, maybe not uh, being afraid of failures. Okay, we all uh, we can all succeed in certain things and fail at other points. So it's very important to accept that uh, it's not always your opinion that will dominate at the end. You have to reach compromises. You have to respect the other, and you have to be able uh, to do to go into this uh, give and take and find win-win uh, solutions. Uh, in addition to that, of course, it's working for very long hours. And uh, at the end of the day, if you really feel uh, that you do something of value, whether to your society or to the international community, this is what keeps you going. Thank you, Rim. Thank you very much, Nevin, for sharing with us your uh, very rich experience. 
and for your uh, motivating uh, speech. Uh, we come now to the final question in this panel, uh, for which I would like to have different uh, viewpoints, mainly from uh, the industry and uh, the academia. So I would like to start with uh, Mrs. Uh, Miho. Uh, what recommendations or advice would you like uh, to give to women who are starting their career in the standardization fields. Thank you very much. Um, I already had a quite um, useful and valuable comment from my colleague here. So I'm not going um, making my comments wrong. Um, I simply want to um, cheer up all women colleagues in ITU. I mean, I'm also attending an ITUD and it's a lot of women is really actively participating over there. So um, here, you know, we are talking about standardization here in the tea sector. So this is a really great place to, um, this is really um, give us the great opportunity to communicate with various experts. And also the um, standardization always dealing with hot topics and also the potential, future potential topics, technical, technical field in the technical field. So you can see how the, the world is going to. And also, um, if you join the world like in ITU, you can also see some global issues such as the standardization gaps and something that it's uh, something really it's difficult, something difficult to um, touch from the private sector, but you can actually see that in this world. So um, you see um, here, um, in particular in the private sector, the, you're the one that we are the one uh, who create, who design and create and develop our own careers. So we always have to consider which skill and what experience is really giving us a certain, um, great value to ourselves. To ourselves. So I really encourage all my colleagues that to um, uh, to use um, this venue as a strategic way, and this give us as a great opportunity. And you see. And Dr. Kim actually mentioned something about the barrier to involve these women. But you see, once the women come to this world in the standardization world, um, what we have to do is actually doesn't have any gaps between men and the women. You see, the number of men and women between men and the women might be still different. But once we do, what we have to do here in this world is exactly the same. During this WTSA, you see that all discussions are ongoing during the day and night, and people really having some tough negotiation um, in this process. So what we have to do is exactly the same. It doesn't matter the men and the women. So we always welcome to join more women participating here. So I really want to say, do not hesitate to take any chance to be in uh, standardized um, standardized uh, members. So that, that's something that I can say from the industry side. So thank you very much um, uh, for your question. Thank you very much, Miho, for your valuable advice. Uh, I would like to ask the same question to Dr. Kim. So Dr. Kim, what recommendation or advice would you like to give uh, to women who are starting uh, their career in the standardization field? Thank you, Rim. Um, yeah, also, my uh, answer would be quite a short. And, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit wonder whether or not I can give them uh, right advice. However, what I want to say is that the, uh, the increasing the number of young and women uh, professional in this uh, period is quite key to a better uh, tomorrow, a better future. So I too is already doing many activities on this closing gender gap, and I too T should engage more actively. So I too T can provide programs to increase the number of women working in technology, including global classroom. So this online learning platform can provide access to online course and resources to improve knowledge and standardization. So also it is essential to provide the same networking opportunities to girls and women to participate in the work of ITT with mentorship. Anybody who has passion and professional background is welcome to this standardization field. 
standardization activities are not only for older men. When you, when you join young, you have much more chance to develop good standards and engage with competent colleagues worldwide. I have seen recently in IT district planning meetings where many women professionals propose a new item from scratch and finish until the end. So now it's your turn, I believe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. Your advices are very helpful for us. Uh, now I would like to ask if there are any questions from the floor uh, due to time constraints. Uh, I think we can have only one question from the floor. So please, uh, if you have one question for, uh, for our distinguished uh, panelists. So I see none uh, because we have a constraint. Uh, so we come uh, to the end of this panel. Uh, so I would like to extend my sincere thanks to our distinguished panelists for their helpful and interesting views and uh, opinion. Now I would like to invite Dr. Bilal Jamosi. So uh, I would like to invite Dr. Bilal Jamusi, the chief of the study groups uh, department at TSB to give a wrap up uh, of the panel discussions. Dr. Bilal, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Reem, Excellency, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'll be very brief to wrap up. Um, basically 12 years ago when I joined ITU, we had in terms of staff, the majority of P5s, the senior counselors, were men. And uh, the one action that the TSP can do is, of course, in terms of hiring and recruiting, give an opportunity to women to grow and uh, to, to take leadership. Uh, today, with the guidance and help of uh, Dr. Lee and previously Dr. Uh, Mr. Malcolm Johnson, uh, we've been able to uh, today have three women P5s and two men. And those three women P5s are, uh, have produced or presented us with GSS, the Secretariat for GSS of this assembly, and the, chair, and the committee secretariat for committee three and four. So when TSB as the staff on the staff side, we can change, make a difference. We can address the gender issue and standards. We also today in uh, TSB, most of our P1, P2 staff are women. And that's the pipeline that we can grow over the next years to ensure that we have equilibrium between men and, and women, at least on the staffing side. Uh, from the delegate perspective, we have always encouraged women to take on leadership positions in study groups, in focus groups. And in this assembly, we have one woman chair of committee five. We have a chair of working group uh, 3A. We have several vice chairs and many of the ad hocs that convened over the weekend Many of them were chaired by women uh, delegates. And that's important because it's an opportunity to grow in an international diverse way uh, to lead us from the membership perspective. Another thing that we can do <clears throat> in TSB, excuse me, is the fellowships. We always try to bias towards having more women uh, participate in, uh, on, on the fellowships. And then in, to conclude, I think in order to uh, achieve our objective of uh, more equilibrium and, and have the gender uh, equation addressed properly. Um, as Naveen was mentioning, there is the need to have the opportunity. So we need to open the door for women colleagues, both in staff and in the delegations to have the opportunity to lead and to be present, to coach, mentor and train, but also to, protect, to provide a safe space, a safe space of any intimidation or harassment. So if we put all of those together, uh, I think there is an opportunity for us to bridge the gap in uh, gender and also to ensure that we have uh, the gender equation and the gender uh, uh, importance in how we develop standards from both the membership and the uh, staff in the team. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and you. happy Women's Day. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bilal, for providing a comprehensive and excellent summary uh, of the main issues discussed during the panel and for highlighting the provided recommendation by the distinguished panelists. So uh, we'll come to our closing session. So uh, the closing, just a few words.
Thanks. Uh, this brings uh, us uh, to the end of this second wise event. Uh, I would like to express my profound uh, gratitude to all of you for your participation in this event. I would like also to take this opportunity to thank all the distinguished speakers and panelists for their valuable insights on the importance of gender matters in setting standards and uh, the transitions to an inclusive environment with the use of frontier technologies such as uh, artificial intelligence, which I believe will improve our approach in standards uh, development uh, processes, as well as achieving the sustainable development goals. Finally, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to all of you who generously helped us in the preparation of this event with a special thanks to the TSB Secretariat. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the WTSA. The second wise event is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.